Welcome to the Brainy 8 Show, where we talk about all things Salesforce, sharing the coolest features, solutions, and best practices to turn you into a Salesforce rock star. Here's your host, former attorney turned Salesforce consultant and trainer, David Giller. Hello and happy Tuesday to all of you. I hope you are all doing well. I am in the New York City area and here we are at the end of March and it's way too cold. I have to tell you, it's not supposed to be this cold this time of the year. But nonetheless, we're going to stay focused. We're going to have fun. And hopefully all of you are going to learn some really important stuff that can help you to really take your Salesforce career to the next level. For those of you who have never joined the live show before, I want to welcome all of you. For those who are watching the replay, many folks can't make uh, the show when it's live during the live time slot for all sorts of reasons, and I totally get it, and I'm not insulted whatsoever. Uh, so th those of you who couldn't make it live, we missed you, but at least you've got the replay where you can always watch the recordings and uh, today's topic is a big one. So many folks, when they start to get into their Salesforce career, the big question becomes, and it sort of feels like a little bit of a catch-22, where do I start? And how do I get hands-on experience when I don't yet have a job? How do I find a job when I don't yet have hands-on experience? And that's really what we're going to be focusing on during today's show. So for those who have never joined before, the show is basically broken up into three different segments. The first is what I often refer to as the talking head segment, where we're really talking about more of a concept and teaching of best practices, strategies. And that's where I'm going to teach you some of the things that you can do in order to broaden your horizons and get yourself some real hands-on experience even before you get your first Salesforce job. We're talking about real experience where anything that you learn on Trailhead, you can actually do it yourselves where that will start to give you a further, like a, I'll call it, <coughs> excuse me, a three-dimensional view into how this feature, how this tool, how this use case works in real life. That will help you when you're on job interviews. That will help you when you're building out your resume. That will help you when you're posting on social media or maybe writing a blog article, not only about how you learned a particular feature on Trailhead, but your own hands-on experience using those features, using those products, using those tools yourself, even before you get your first Salesforce job. So the first segment, I'll spend about 20 minutes talking about the strategies of the things that you, <coughs> excuse me. I have been sick since January. It's been kind of hellish. So I apologize <coughs> for the coughing. Um, so I'm the first 20 minutes, I'm going to focus on the strategies on uh, what you can do in order to get yourselves the hands-on experience. The second segment, about another 20 minutes, I'm going to show you hands-on in Salesforce screen sharing. I'm going to actually show you what you can do, an example of the kinds, the ways that you can take the knowledge of whatever it is that you're learning on Trailhead and actually make it live. Do it hands-on directly in Salesforce. The third segment, about 20 minutes, open Q&A. So as you can see by the scrolling ticker down below, if you have any questions on anything that I'm talking about or anything else that's Salesforce related, if I'm able to answer those questions, by all means, go ahead and throw it in the comments below. And when we get to that last segment, I'll make sure to go over all of the questions and do my best to try and answer all of them. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump in to the first segment, which is how to get hands-on Salesforce admin experience. So let's take it a step back and think about any 
industry outside of Salesforce, any other industry, any other type of job, whether we're talking about being an airline pilot or being a doctor or being uh, an Uber driver, any, uh, being a lifeguard, being a babysitter, for any of those careers, for any of those industries, what would you do? Or what would you expect your friend to do if your friend told you that they were interested in pursuing one of those careers? Well, the first thing they would have to do is start to become familiar with what's involved in any of those careers. They would have to start to learn the skills, the terminology, the different tools that are used within that particular industry. They would have to start to become familiar with the best practices, associated to that industry. And let's make believe a friend turns to you and says, you know, I have been watching tons of YouTube videos, reading lots of books, learning how to fly an airplane. I cannot believe that no one will hire me to be a pilot on an airplane. I just don't believe it. Like, no one will hire me. Why? Like, I read all of these books. Maybe even I got some certifications. I sat down for a, a, a bunch of exams, not only one or two, 10 exams, 15 exams. I'm certified to fly an airplane in all of these different states, yet no one is hiring me to actually be a pilot because I don't have any hands-on experience. What would you turn to that friend? What would you say to them? What would you... what? What do you think it would apply for any other industry? In most industries, in almost every industry, in order to get that ultimate job that you want of being behind the, behind, in the cockpit, behind the wheel of, or whatever they call it, the controls of an airplane, in order to be the person in the Uber, behind the steering wheel driving the car, in order to be the lifeguard who is standing in front of a swimming pool with people swimming in the pool, enjoying themselves. First, you would have to be a junior or associate or assistant for that type of role. You would first need to actually take a job where like we need to let go of our ego a little bit and be a little bit humble, like, okay, I learned a whole lot. I spent a lot of hours. I gained a, I sat for a lot of exams and I passed them and that's really impressive, but I haven't yet stood in front of a swimming pool to watch people and be responsible for their lives. So, okay, first you need to actually take a role where you are in the shadows of looking over the shoulder of, or someone is looking over your shoulder with more experience doing that thing where, okay, you're coming to the job having become familiar with the terminology and the best practices and, and, and you know, seeing simulations of what's supposed to happen when you're actually on the job. But for almost every industry, first you need to have that junior role where you are working under the supervision of someone else that has more experience, where you are not expected to have had that experience coming in in order to get that job. And once you are under the supervision of someone else and that person feels comfortable, again, it could be a lifeguard, it could be a driver, it could be you know any other type of industry. Once you're working under someone who is able to supervise and guide you and coach you and teach you, then you're able to step up to actually become the person, quote unquote, in control, the person of that more senior level that you're trying to go after. Now, there are many people, including Salesforce as a company, by the way, who will take on a particular marketing approach and make it seem like all you have to do is follow this recipe. All you have to do is complete this trail or this trail mix and boom, you can just get a job earning fill in the blank, 60,000, 80,000, $120,000 a year. 
that's the equivalent of watching a commercial on TV where someone tells you, oh, I just bought this rubber band and this is what I do with the rubber band and I've lost 60 pounds. They're not sharing all of the other details about how much time and effort and how much they starved themselves and all of the other things that they did in order to achieve that goal. They're simplifying it. They've Twitterized it. They're trying to candy coat it. Don't be fooled by any of that. There is real hard work that needs to go into it. It is still completely achievable. And I'm going to show you what you need to do in order to get the hands-on experience before you get that first roll. So let's jump in over here. The first thing that you should do is start to think about your own past experiences. Think of the strengths that you have. What is it that you are familiar with already? You might have had other jobs where you, <laughs> excuse me, you might have had other jobs where you worked in a particular industry. You might have been maybe a receptionist in an accounting firm. Maybe you were a store manager in a local retail store. Maybe you worked as a waiter in a restaurant. And you saw, regardless of what those experiences might be, by the way, it could be that you were simply a customer in any of those kinds of scenarios or any other industry, and you experienced for yourself certain business use cases that resonated with you, that stood out to you as there's probably a better way to do this. So you might have some familiarity with a particular industry, a particular business problem. You might have never had a job before, but in school you learned about or you heard from a friend about some type of business scenario. A friend was complaining to you how they applied for a, a bunch of jobs and nobody got back to them. That is a use case by itself where you can take that experience that maybe you did not even have, but your friend had, and that resonates with, with you. That's something that sticks out for you. That's something that if you had your own, you know, wave the magic wand, you had your own job as a Salesforce admin, that is a problem that you would like to see fixed. Pick anything like that that resonates with you. So think about your own prior experience and think about what, type of business problem or use case can you bring to the table where you get excited about solving that particular problem? You happen to know about certain unique scenarios that happen when managing that type of business behind the scenes. It might be scheduling of people or resources, or it might be following up with customers that have a particular customer support issue. It could be anything. So first, just think for yourself about any past experience that really resonates with you. The next thing that you can do, and this is a little bit of an obvious one, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, earn some certifications. But that's not even the most important. It's ideal if you want to be considered for any type of role as a Salesforce admin to have, at the very least, the basic Salesforce admin certification. That's absolutely true. But I'll tell you, if I were hiring someone now, and if I had two candidates or three candidates with their resumes in front of me, and one had only one certification, and another one had 10 certifications, and another one had 30 certifications, would I be more impressed with the one with 10 certifications or 30 certifications? No. I would be more impressed with these people's ability to apply what they've learned, even from the most basic certification, to apply it in realistic scenarios, to apply it to solve problems. Anyone can study and pass a certification exam. It's a numbers game. And in the real world, it doesn't really impress a whole lot of people. So... Just get the basic admin certification if you're interested and you have the time and you love taking tests and you've got nothing else to do. Go ahead, knock yourself out, earn whatever certifications you want. But as far as I'm concerned, if I had a candidate in front of me with 
15, 20 plus certifications, I would think this person has nothing better to do with their lives but to sit and take certification exams. They have, they, they are so busy with the certification exams that they've never even tried to play around hands-on to solve a real problem on the Salesforce platform. That's what I personally would think. So earn certifications, but don't make yourself crazy about it. Next up, if you have any other degrees, leverage those. Why? Because your educational background, any degree that you might have in maybe education or psychology or business management, any degree that you might have gave you some insight on into some particular industries and businesses that overlap with that type of degree or the field of study that you pursued. That means that if you can find the intersection between whatever it is that you have a degree in, maybe it's a degree in the fine arts. You have a degree in the fine arts because you love arts and, and, and paintings and the different styles of paintings and the history of who painted what and how the styles of paintings have changed and where certain paintings are located. Guess what? You can start to apply that. Make believe you are the manager of a museum or an art collection and you want to start tracking all of the art pieces that you have in your collection and think about what are the attributes that are important for us to track regarding our art collection. And what are the different types of transactions that might happen within that industry being the manager of a museum that we might want to track? Well, maybe it's certain pieces of art that we are lending out maybe to another museum. Maybe we want to be able to track, maybe we have a special exhibit and we want to be able to track ticket sales to a particular exhibit and which art pieces are part of that exhibit. So you can come up with all different kinds of use cases depending on the type of degree that you have. If the degree that you have is something that truly interests you, find the intersection between that and a business use case or several business use cases and you're going to apply that in what I'm going to show you soon. You're going to apply that hands-on to start thinking of what are the different ways that the Salesforce platform can help businesses that are in that industry that overlap with the degree, the educational background that I have and that is not only going to help you stand out among other candidates who are looking for a job, but that's also going to be a, an intersection that is going to excite you tremendously because if you're interested in whatever area of education that you pursued in your degree and you're interested in having your, focusing your career in the Salesforce platform, you're going to absolutely love doing that type of work where those two things intersect and you're going to really come to the table with particular insights and knowledge and wisdom and ideas that someone else who has more certifications, maybe even more hands-on experience in Salesforce, but does not have that educational background, you're going to stand far above them you know, when you're comparing, comparing two different people. So think about and leverage any degrees that you might have. Next, as I mentioned before, you need to be a little bit humble. Don't think just because you spent X number of hours or days or months or years studying on trailhead and passing Salesforce certification exams, therefore you're entitled to whatever type of job title is out there, which, which is your, you know, your reach goal of where you'd like to be. That doesn't necessarily mean that's realistic. I mean, go ahead, you know, aim for the sky. That's, that's fine. But the, in the real world, if you don't have experience being a lifeguard, I'm not going to hire you to supervise my swimming pool, you know, to just watch people without somebody else there. You're going to be the assistant lifeguard. You're not going to be the lifeguard. So you need to think a little bit about taking it down a notch in terms of what your entry job is going to have as the job title or the responsibilities. So, 
be a little bit realistic is basically what I'm trying to say. I'm not going to harp too much on that. Next, the power of mark of networking. When you're networking, think about all the things that I have listed up above uh, on this slide that you're looking at right now. You have your past experience and even if it's just one certification and whatever degrees that you have and you're a little bit more realistic about the type of first job that you're going to get in the Salesforce in the Salesforce ecosystem, as you're networking, and you could still do networking remotely, by the way, as you're networking, as you're meeting other people, talk about it. When people ask about you and what you're doing and what your interest is in the Salesforce platform and what your career goals are, start to weave in all of these other elements into your story, into how you introduce yourself, into the way that you describe to someone what type of job, what type of role you're looking for. And as you continue to have these conversations with other people, they will start to have an understanding of where you might fit in, who they could introduce you to, where you could be that perfect puzzle piece to the problem that they are looking to solve. And lastly, this is the most important, <laughs> which is why I left it for last and it helps us segue into the next segment, leverage developer orgs, and that's plural. So what am I talking about here? What I'm talking about is think of any of the use cases that I brought up within the last couple of minutes and you don't yet have that first job and you want and need to get some hands-on experience so that you can have intelligent, substantive conversations with people about the things that you can do on the Salesforce platform. You want to be able to have that your own knowledge, your own realistic scenario where you can take the things that you've learned on Trailhead and actually do it hands-on in Salesforce. If you didn't know, Salesforce lets us create free developer orgs, as many as you want. So create a new developer org and leverage it in order to take any of these use cases that, that I suggested before or any other one that really resonates with you and go into that org and start to build out the solution to the business problems that you've identified. And that's where we're going to, I'm going to show you exactly how to do that in the next segment. So here we are, we're not yet looking at Salesforce. And what we are looking at instead is a, um, a flowchart that I created in a lucid chart. <laughs> I'm trying a blank on my words. And Basically, I am taking a use case over here of book lending. I am purposely choosing something that is not going to throw anybody off. So I'm not going to talk about any particular industry that someone is not familiar with, a particular use case that someone is not familiar with. Think about for yourself. And by the way, where I got this idea from is from my own son. My son took my Salesforce admin bootcamp and he decided for himself in order to make everything that he learned real, he was going to start his own developer org and create, it started off as simply a database of books. And then he realized, oh, you know what? Since I have books and I also have contacts and accounts, I can start tracking any borrowing that friends are doing or any lending requests, whatever type of terminology you want to use in Salesforce. So I have this book and I want to be able to see who did I lend it out to? Because if I look in Salesforce, I, I you know, I could see, I could find the book, you know, we wave the magic wand, we build a, an object, uh, you know, for books and we build all of the appropriate fields, but we also have uh, an object for contacts and we have another one for accounts. So I can also track by creating another object, I can track all of the lending that is taking place. 
what was the start date of this, you know, when someone borrowed a particular book? Which book did they borrow? When did they give it back? Did they give it back? So I simply drew it over here and I'm keeping it super simple, very rudimentary. And by the way, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to start showing you how to actually build it out in case it's, you're struggling a little bit with how to make this, how to make this a little bit more real. So, okay, we have over here on the left-hand side, we have this object for households. And by the way, when we're talking about households, if for those of you who are not familiar already with uh, how Salesforce is used for nonprofits with NPSP, this is where uh, this concept is really coming from, but uh, households are really accounts. And in NPSP, it's really just accounts with a different record type. So when you go to create a new account, it's asking you, is it a household or is it something else? Meaning uh, like a, a business account. And if it's a household record type for an account, then it has the exact same paradigm, the exact same model as any other Salesforce org, where you have contacts that roll up to that particular household account. So we have households and we have people. People are contacts. And we have, let's uh, leave alone the whole borrowing section that we have here for a minute. Let's look over here where we have books. So we create a new custom object to track books. Now, by the way, we could also think larger, which is part of the learning experience, even if you decided to pursue exactly this. You might start building it out for books and then you say, oh, wait, I also want to be able to track when someone borrows something else, like maybe electronics. Someone wanted to borrow my laptop case. Someone wanted to borrow uh, a mouse that I have. Someone wanted to borrow anything else. So we might say, you know what? We're not going to call the object books, but instead maybe we're going to call it assets. Now, by the way, Salesforce also has a native out-of-the-box object called assets and you might want to simply leverage that or you can create your own if for whatever reason you want to explore doing your own. So what I'm suggesting is you can create a separate object for a particular type of thing that you're going to lend out. But in the meantime, if you really wanted to make it scalable, you can create and you can use a naming convention for this custom object of something like assets, where you then have a record type when someone goes to create a new one. Well, what type of an asset is it? Is it a book? Is it, should I suggest DVDs? Nobody's using DVDs anymore. Is it a, is it a, a piece of electronics? Is it, uh, I don't know, money perhaps? So you can think of a lot of different things that you might wanna be able to track in this whole area. Uh, but again, you could decide to start small as an object of just for books. But then when you start realizing that you wanna track other things, you might not want to create another custom object. Just repurpose this one for other use cases. And then you want to be able to track the borrowing that's happening. That's what we have over here in the center that's in red. So what you need to think about is just like for any business, start thinking about what does that process look like? How does a borrowing request get initiated? Is it by phone? Is it by email? And by the way, if it is by email, then maybe you want to, with your dev org, you start, you implement the Salesforce to Outlook integration. Or maybe you download a free trial of another tool like Cirrus Insight, where when you're in Gmail or you're in Outlook and you receive an email from a friend and that person is asking, hey, by the way, you have uh, you know, um, the Harry Potter series. Can I borrow the first book in the Harry Potter series? You might say, oh, you know what? Yeah, sure. Uh, and, from your inbox, you can turn that into a brand new record. You can, from your inbox, you can create the contact, you can create the account, you can create that uh, other custom record on a custom object where you're tracking what it is that they are asking to borrow and the status, the dates, etc. that you want to, you can do that all from your inbox. So you're getting some real hands-on, real life, realistic experience that you can actually leverage by thinking about just the different use cases that we have over here of how does that request get initiated. So we might have phone, we might have email, maybe you want to have a web form. 
Maybe you want to try building out a portal. So maybe you want to have for all of your friends, you want to give them access to, by the way, when I say portal, what I'm really talking about is you can have a dev instance of Experience Cloud, and you can build this out with Experience Cloud where you're simulating how you give access to your community, your Experience Cloud instance to a particular friend and what is it that they are able to see? How do they initiate the request? How do they then follow up with you on that particular request? So you can go ahead and start simulating all of these things just from thinking about how the process even gets initiated. Then start to think about what are the data points that you need to track for each book, each borrowing experience, each person and each household. What are the details that you need for each person? You may or may not care to have their mailing address, but you m certainly need their email address. You might want to capture their mobile number. Do you want those to be required? Maybe you don't care about their job title at their place of employment. That's fine. But what details do you need to capture about each of these things, about each book, about each lending that's happening, about each person and about each household? Think about what type of metrics or reports are you going to need when you, you know, after you've lent out some stuff to a whole bunch of people, do you want to be able to see like maybe which book was lent out most frequently, which item was or who borrowed things for the longest period of time, um, what month you get the most requests to borrow certain things. So you can think of a lot of different use cases. All of these are going to be completely applicable to any job in any industry that you might want to apply for. Next, start thinking about what types of alerts or reminders will you want? What type of automation do you think might be helpful to, in order to implement in these use cases? Think about what are the different statuses that you might need to track for each item that gets borrowed or for each lending experience that happens. And as I suggested before, what happens when you want to start tracking lending out of other things like I have over here like maybe you want your people really love your shovel you have neighbors that en are envious of your shovel and they want to borrow it so you maybe you want to be able to track that or maybe your bicycle so would those processes be any different from when someone is let's say borrowing a book and would any data points be different for when someone borrows a book versus when they're borrowing a shovel or money. Are you planning on charging them interest or anything like that? Like, what do you, what, how are any of those scenarios different from anything that you are tracking as it relates to the lending out of books? And are there any reports that might be different for any of those use cases when someone is borrowing a book versus something else? So again, this is just an example of how you can leverage a free developer org in Salesforce. And like I suggested before, you don't have to track anything about books or lending of books. If the experience of, of uh, applying for jobs and not hearing back from people about the jobs that you've applied for is something that annoys you, go ahead and set up an instance where you're tracking job applications and the openings for those jobs and the interviewing process that you would implement if you were let's say an HR manager or a senior leader within an organization, what, what is the process that you would want to implement? What kind of email con confirmation emails, notification emails, update emails would you want to give to the job candidates who are applying for jobs versus the hiring managers to, for them to be able to know and see here is the new candidate that just came in and here are their qualifications and attached is their resume. So what are those, what do those processes look like? This can give you, if you follow this example, this can give you an unlimited number of use cases that you can implement in not only one, but several developer orgs. So when you're learning something on Trailhead, simply figure out how can you apply that to any of these use cases 
in your own developer org and start building it out. And you could be creative about it. You can come up with your own processes. You can leverage something that you've experienced yourself, something that really resonates with you. And that will help you uh, build things out that will also build out your own experience and give you a much richer amount of substantive content to talk about on job interviews, to post on social media, to create YouTube videos about, to write articles about, etc. So now I'm going to show you, I, I, I have over here, you know, the, uh, the, the drawing of how I would structure out this particular org. And now I'm going to show you, here I have a brand new developer org that I just created last night exclusively for the purpose of today's live show. And I did not customize anything in here. And by the way, many of you already know some of my, uh, I'll call them pet peeves, uh, or on the flip side, best practices as it relates to designing the Salesforce screens, of minimizing the tabs on the top, or when you're looking at any particular record. So if I go over here and I look at contacts, and you can see recently viewed, I did not look at any uh, records in here. When looking at any particular record, many of you know that the default layout that Salesforce gives us is something that I just find super annoying. I did not clean up any of that. So I, all I did was I created a brand new org over here. And I'm going to show you right now within the next couple of minutes how if I were you and I wanted to build out the... Um, the scenario that I showed you earlier right over here with books and the borrowing, let's go ahead and build this out right now. And I'm going to show you how incredibly simple it is. So I'm going to go over here into setup. It's not going to be complete. I'm just going to show you like how to get in the right direction to start doing all of this. And I can go over here to object manager or I can go right over here to create custom object. Either one works. And let's go ahead and build out. For now, let's make believe all I ever care to track is books and nothing else. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to call this um, book and plural is books. And I'm going to go over here. By the way, for those of you who have uh, never uh, taken any of my courses before, um, a best practice I'm going to give you right here. If you walk away with nothing else but with this, it's going to be a win. OK, so when you are creating a custom object and you are presented with this section where we have the record name and Salesforce gives us uh, over here the, uh, the record name and it's called, you know, object name and uh, with the word name in it. So book name. So if I call this cars, it would be cars name. It, opportunities. We have opportunity name. So the same is true for any type of custom object. This often gives users a lot of grief because they don't necessarily know what to call that thing. And in this scenario, it might not necessarily be the title of the book. So what I'm going to show you here is how to, instead of having this as a source of pain, how to relieve this pain and totally automate it. Instead of calling it book name, I do this almost every time for almost every custom object that I create for any project that I'm working on, call it entry. So it's going to be the entry in the database. This way, each one is going to have its own unique numerical sequence. So nobody has to, you can create another field for, let's say for book title, because by the way, if you have, if later we decide to repurpose this object to track electronics or my shovel or a bicycle, Am I giving my shovel a name? No. Am I giving my bicycle a name? No. What if I have two different Toshiba or HP laptops? Which one am I tracking? Do they have a name? No, they do not. This is simply an entry in the database. So first thing you do is you call this entry. The next thing you do is you go over here, you, you select auto number. And for the display format, like Salesforce is showing right over here. So what we're going to do is because I'm calling this object books, so I'm just going to have the letter B, so I, I find any type of initials or abbreviation for that particular object. So I'm going to choose B, and I'm going to go over here and put in the curly brackets and put in a bunch of zeros. So that's the format that I want this entry to follow. And 
the it should start with the number of one. And I want to go over here, allow reports, allow activities, track field history. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, let's do all of that. Allow search, uh, add notes and attachments. Nope. Uh, launch a custom tab. Yes, we want to do that. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to hit save. So we create our custom object and now let's go over here and let's choose and where did my pop-up go? Of course it went to my other monitor over here. So let's choose, um, we have books over here, beautiful. So let's go here and hit next. And sure, default on, we're the only user in the dev org so we really don't have to worry over here. Sure, include it in the tab of every uh, app, not a problem. And now let's go here and let's create a couple of other fields. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on here because I think this part is really not rocket science. I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna choose text. We're gonna choose the book title. Let's choose book author and we'll just leave it at that. So uh, I'll just call it title. And let's give it, uh, you know what, 200 characters should suffice. And let's go here and just hit next. Ideally, I'll put in a description. Maybe I'll put in a, a help bubble. For now, I'm just going to keep it very simple. And let's go here and put in for the, um, we're gonna create a field for the author. Now, by the way, in theory, I could have the author be a lookup back to contacts. If I wanted to create a, a, a separate database of tracking the different authors, I can go ahead and do that. However, it also opens up a can of worms. What if you have a book that was written by two people? Two people are listed as the author. Who am I selecting? How do I choose more than one? No, you don't want to have two separate lookup fields of author one and author two. No, no, no. Just keep it really simple for now. So I'm just going to have it as a text field and call it author. And let's make that 255. Then I'll just hit next. Next and save. So, okay, we created our, um, we created our custom object for books and we can see over here, we've got the book layout over here and uh, we, there's not that much that we really have to do over here. By the way, this is another little pet peeve of mine. I usually do something like this by making that visible and making the system information section label visible. It just gives a little bit more logic order to what we have going on over here. So we've got that. Okay, great. So we just took care of building out the books object. These two, we don't really have to worry about because Salesforce already gave it to us with the exception of uh, the account or not household. But the truth is, if we also expect that we're only going to track households, maybe we don't even need to do anything. Just leave it alone with the default, um, the, the default uh, settings for the account object and at some point in the future we can introduce record types to separate households from other types of accounts that we might want to track. So now over here we have borrow lending. So if we want to be able to track that let's go ahead and let's go back into object manager and let's go ahead and create another object and let's call this lending. And of course, we want to allow reports and activities and field history. Sure, why not? Of course, we want to allow search. And yeah, let's give it its own custom tab. So now we can go over here and we can, uh, let's find an icon for this. And I'll choose a bridge because why not? And let's go here, include tab, sure. And now for our fields, well, we need a lookup to the contact. So let's go here and look up relationship. And we wanna look up relationship to the contact. Come on Salesforce, keep up with me. I'm just gonna hit next for all of these and sure, put it on all of them, why not? We want to be able to track what it is that that person is borrowing. So we need another lookup to, so this is the junction object that we're creating. We created the link to the person who's borrowing it. Now we need to create the link to the book that is being borrowed. So lookup relationship and let's go here and we're going to choose book.
And let's think about what are the other attributes that we want to track. Well, we want to be able to track a status, uh, maybe requested, borrowed, returned. Maybe we want to have the date that it, the borrowing started, the date that the borrowing ended. So we can go ahead and we can start building out those things. For now, I'm just going to keep it super simple and uh, to be sensitive to time, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to create a pick list and I'm going to call it status. And requested. Uh, you know what, maybe we want to have one called rejected. In other words, someone asked us to borrow it, but we did not uh, approve it <laughs> and uh, um, borrowed. Um, yeah, we'll call it borrowed. And returned. And rejected. And let's go ahead and do that. Now, by the way, even as I just created this uh, pick list field for status, some of you should be thinking along the lines of having a path on the page layout to track the status. So for now, I'm just going to leave this alone as it is. Now let's go ahead and create uh, a special app because as I mentioned before, We've got a lot of clutter over here and none of that is needed. If, if we have particular users who are only going to be using Salesforce to be able to track the lending, they don't need all of that other nonsense. So let's go ahead and create a new custom app and we're gonna call this uh, Lending. And if we wanted, we can go ahead and upload an image. We can create a specific color. For now, I'm going to leave all of that alone and let's, yeah, let's leave all of the default settings over here. We're not gonna add a utility item. So what is it that is needed for this particular app? Well, we certainly want the home screen. So, whoops, not that. Home, I don't even know what that is. Uh, we want accounts. We want contacts. We want books. And we want lending. And we might want reports and dashboards, and that's it. Keep it simple. And since we are the only users here, let's go ahead and only make it available for system admin. Okay, so now that we did that, let's give this a whirl. And by the way, I did not really do anything with the page layouts or the related lists and how they look. But if I now go over here and I look for the lending app and I navigate over into it, I'm going to see that I have a much cleaner user interface. I have only those tabs that are relevant appearing over here. So now if I wanted to track, uh, let's see, what was the name? Arthur Song. If I wanted to track a book and a lending experience. I go here and first let's create our new our first book because we don't even have a book in here. So let's call this uh, Harry Potter book one, uh, JK Rowling, save. So that's the only book that we've got, great. So now that we're looking at this book and yes, I'm cringing a little bit with a page layout because this is not the way that I would like it to be. So now I want to track lending and I wanna create a new lending record. Of course I could do it from here or I could do it from here. So I'm gonna go here, new lending and lend, oh, this is where, wait, I didn't put it. I should have done the auto num numeric entry thing that I told you about. I'm so annoyed with myself. Okay, for now, I'm just gonna do the test and uh, contact. We're gonna choose Arthur Song and we're gonna choose that first book. And we're gonna go over here for status and let's say requested. So boom, I just created that first uh, simulated record in this new org. So now if I wanted to, I can do maybe I wanted, I wanted to learn since I learned in Trailhead about how to do data imports, maybe I want to prepare a spreadsheet and I want to import a bunch of books. And then maybe I want to import a bunch of lending records. Maybe I want to import a bunch of additional contacts. So then we want to see, for example, for Arthur Song, any of the lending that he, that he has done. So if I go over here and now I can see for lending, keep in mind, I did not update the uh, the page layout, the related list, in order to see over here when it started, what the status was, etc. But that's what I would do if, 
if I had more time to focus on this, I sort of wanted to take you through some of the initial steps of how to start building this out. And then even more so, like I mentioned before, how to remove the clutter if this Salesforce org is only going to be used, maybe only for certain users it's going to be used in this way. Those users don't need to see all of these other related lists. It's a total distraction for them. So think about what are the related lists that you would remove from these page layouts for those users. And even here on the contact record, what data points are totally not relevant that you can remove from the page layouts for these users who are simply managing the lending of books, the requests associated with the books. Anyway, hopefully that gives you some ideas on how you can take it to the next level and start taking anything that you're learning in Trailhead and start building it out in a dev org and start to make what you're learning real. And that's going to help you to speak more intelligently and with more confidence when you are applying for jobs. So let's say you're applying for a job where they're talking about a certain type of automation or validation rules or setting up certain page layouts with dynamic components that are only visible in certain use cases. If you've taken it to that level where you've actually played around with all of these things, you will be able to speak intelligently to any potential employer where it does not matter if you were paid to actually build that out or sim you simply gained the experience on your own and learned it for yourself by, by taking your own life experiences, the problems that you've seen in the real world and simply applying your potential solution to that problem directly in Salesforce in your own dev org. By the way, in a job interview, you might even inspire the person interviewing you to uh, actually bring up your dev org on the screen and actually start showing them what you've done and how you've solved for some of these use cases. So without further ado, let's jump into your questions. So let me take a look over here and see some of the questions that you guys have over here. Um, so I'm going to back it up a little bit and da, 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 da. anyone from Pep Up Tech here. Okay. How do you recommend getting more hands on, uh, Brandon, how do you recommend getting more hands on experience when getting to the next level wherever that is? So honestly, if you're, if you want to learn about flows and uh, you know, just like I showed as it relates to lending of books, if you want to be a developer, start thinking about what problems could you solve for? What are the use cases as it relates to the lending requests or the following up on things that have been borrowed? Or maybe you want to block someone from borrowing something, you know, where if they have too many things that are outstanding where it should not be approved or automated reminders, maybe it's email reminders to the person who borrowed something saying, hey, you were supposed to return this on whatever date and we still haven't gotten it. You can build all of those same things out in your developer org, um, just like as if you were getting paid to do that on the job. So in my mind, you can totally uh, build that out. Uh, Felice, I've, uh, I've been open to starting at the bottom of uh, career fairs. I've heard this isn't for you. The reason is this is for recent grads and you won't be happy. What is your advice? I'll tell you, in my mind, when I hear things like that, what that really means is that the employer is not they're looking to get away on the cheap in other words the level of compensation that they are offering is not going to match someone that has more experience they're not actually really saying you're too smart for the job what they're really saying is we can't afford to pay the level of compensation that we think you deserve so as hard as that is to hear that's actually a good thing because it means that even if you know you, you you do impress them with all of the skills that you have, they're still too cheap to write a check to you to make payroll for you um, in terms of where they are. Now, 
don't be insulted by that uh, because companies try to make uh, try to accomplish what they need to in the most frugal way that they can and very often they learn most of the time they learn from those mistakes because sadly very often people step into roles where they are not qualified they don't have the appropriate even internal coaching or mentorship those people don't pursue external coaching or mentorship or guidance on how to do their jobs and it's the equivalent of putting a toddler in the driver's seat of a car and it's pretty much guaranteed to crash the question is how bad will the damage be and how quick will it take for people to realize the level of damage that was caused so in in many regards uh, uh my response to that is walk away from it because that means it's really not for you that a they either can't afford to simply pay you at your level or b they think that someone with far less experience can do the job in the same way and sadly they will experience the implications of that as time goes on so this is a uh, this is something that by the way as a consultant I experience this myself all the time when uh, uh, I'm talking to a prospect and they are asking me about how we can help them with certain things and then when we talk about well how much do you charge for the services that uh, that uh, that you provide and if they're going to compare the uh, amount that I charge for my services compared to someone who's starting out in their career as a Salesforce admin yeah that other person is going to uh, want and expect a fraction of what I'm charging and if that's the road that they want to pursue good luck to them uh, so I, it, as frustrating as it might be it's actually, it's just not a good fit. So uh, keep your head high and you'll do fine. You'll see, you'll find the right match. Uh, Mary's got a question over here. And we're going to wrap up shortly uh, because I want to be sensitive to the time. Uh, is a dev org different from a playground? So the short answer is yes. Um, dev orgs are, as Brian answered right over here, dev orgs are really for yourself uh, to, whoops, I clicked on the wrong one, sorry, it was both, they were both from Brian, um, where a playground is for Trailhead to see that you were able to accomplish uh, what they are asking of you and to check whether or not you've implemented the settings that Trailhead is asking in a particular module that you're in. A dev org, think of a dev, dev org as being more long lasting where nothing else that you're going to do on Trailhead, so long as you don't connect it to Trailhead, uh, nothing on Trailhead is going to mess up anything that you have in your dev org. So if you don't know how to create a dev org, uh, by the way, just Google it. Uh, create free Salesforce dev org. It's yours for life. You can have as many. I'm not familiar with any limitation uh, so on how many you can have. So I think you will find that very helpful. Uh, I'm looking to see whether or not there are, okay, there are some other questions over here. Brian, how would you list the dev org project on your resume? List it out. You don't need to mention, but and I, I'm not at all suggesting hiding the information or lying. You simply don't need to mention that it's in your dev org. So still talk about the 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 familiarity that you have with certain features, the different types of projects that you've worked on, and you can absolutely say. By the way, uh, for me as a hiring manager. I would say I'd be even more impressed if someone, I'd be more impressed with someone who had their resume filled with all of the different types of things that they've done in their dev org versus someone who has um, collected a bunch of certifications and not had a single actual real job. That would be very impressive to me. That shows someone who is motivated, someone who is self-disciplined, someone that I'll be able to just give a project to and feel with some level of confidence that they can go out on their own and they can 
absolutely come back to me with clarifying questions, with follow-up, or they want me to look at some of the things that they've built out. But otherwise, they, they know how to take a conceptual problem or use case and actually turn it into a real Salesforce in implementation or enhancement to uh, an existing implementation. So I think, uh, yeah, you should totally list it out on your resume. And there's no problem in listing it out as uh, being in your dev org. All right, it looks like that's it for, for today. There aren't any other questions and we are at the top of the hour. Thank you all for joining me today. I hope you found this helpful. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.